So, of course, Thursdays we're going through the book of Matthew, and tonight we'll be in the uh, Matthew chapter 10, going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's our Bible study on Thursday nights. And Matthew's a, a kind of a longer chapter, a lot of uh, a lot of material here. But getting right into it, it says there in uh, Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And so this is a, a really special miracle that, uh, or, or, or you want to say, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word powers, you know, like he's, you know, turned them into the X-Men or something like that. But, I mean, that's really what it is. He's given them powers to... To, to heal the sickness and, and to heal all manner of disease and to cast out devils. These are very special, you know, gifts that he has given unto men. And uh, but these abilities, I believe, that Jesus gave uh, to his uh, disciples here are exclusive to the apostles. That's, that's kind of my opinion from what I've seen in Scripture. I've heard other people kind of talk about this and discuss this and, and say that, you know, maybe it is for us today, certain aspects of it. And... Uh, in certain instances and in the early church, I do believe that there were a few of these things that were given unto others that were not apostles. An apostle would be somebody that uh, was with, had been, you know, uh, had seen the ministry of Christ starting with the baptism of John all the way until his ascension into heaven. That's what would have made an apostle. It would have been somebody that had uh, followed Christ and witnessed the, the, the resurrected Christ. And uh, we find that elsewhere in scripture, but I don't want to go into all that for sake of time. After all, there's a lot to get here. Uh, get to here in Matthew chapter 10, but I do believe that um, these things that are uh, Jesus gave, these abilities are exclusive to these apostles, mm -hmm. and one of the places that people who would kind of object or would say otherwise is they would turn to uh, Mark 16, so let's turn to Mark 16, and they would say, well, if you turn to Mark 16, you read there, you'll see where, where it sounds like Jesus is giving this to just anybody, anybody that believes on the name of Christ, and anybody that's saved has these abilities, or should have them, or could have them, uh, you know. But we'll read here in Math or Mark chapter 16, where it reads in verse 15, and he said unto them, Going into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. So he's saying, look, you're going to go out, you're going to baptize, and when you kind of read this, you know, it's that first glance, just kind of reading it over. It does sound like what he's saying is that everybody gets that believes after us all after all it says there and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover now the now here so when we read this we could say well yeah that makes sense there it sounds like that's what he's saying that if like for instance we went out so many today and somebody got saved as I understand we had one get saved is that correct and we went out there, and if that person got saved, well, now they should be able to do all these things. You know, they should be able to, you know, take up serpents and, and drink any deadly thing, you know. But will we tell them that at the door and say, hey, you know what? Now you can go back there and take care of that, you know, that scorpion nest. That, you know, no more calling the orchid man kind of thing. No, we wouldn't say that, right? But, I mean, some people would say that that's what this a passage appears to be saying, that some people, whoever, get, whoever it is that gets saved, them that believe, could go and do any of these things. But I believe what this, what, if we look at this passage a little closer and in the context of this chapter, we'll see that the believers of verse 16 are not the same as the verse 17. Because it says there, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, right? And he that believeth not is, 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 well, shall be damned. So he's talking about a specific group of believers, you know, those that would be saved. And then he says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Now I believe what he's, he's talking to, when he says the, the, in verse 17, he's actually referring to the disciples those that believe on him, his apostles. And now we see that if you go back to Mark chapter 16, verse 14. So just back up one verse. Where it says, After he appeared on the eleven as he sat at meat and upbraided them uh, with their unbelief and hardness of heart. So here he finds them in a state where they're not believing. Mm -hmm. They're not believing in Christ. They're not believing those things which they had heard because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. You know, you think of the doubting Thomas. You think how... When they, when the, uh, the Mary came back and gave the report, they didn't believe, you know, and, and they didn't believe those that had said, hey, Christ is risen. And he comes and he's saying, well, now that's who he's referring to there. Those that uh, would believe, and these signs shall follow them that believe. I'm, I, I believe he's referring to those that, his apostles, who previously did not believe, but now do believe, if that makes sense. Now, that might not make perfect sense, but we can kind of clarify this a little bit more. 
and test the waters and see, does Mark 16 really apply to every believer? Well, let's just go through each of these signs in Mark 16 and see about it. And we'll look at scripture and see uh, who it is that actually carried out these things that, that uh, Christ said you could do in Mark 16. And then we'll look at some of the people today that are claiming to do it. Uh, some of these, these signs that, they, at, that, that are given here in Mark 16. Now, if you go over to, uh, keep something in Mark 16, go over to Acts 28. You see, the first thing in Mark 16 is that they will, well, not the first thing, but one of the things is that they will take up serpents, right? They'll take up serpents. Now, who is it in Scripture that we actually see an example of, of doing this? In taking up serpents. Well, that would, be, um, that would be the Apostle Paul. If you recall here in Acts chapter 28, verse 1, where it says, And when they were escaped, then they, uh, then they knew that the island was called Melita, and the barbarous people showed no little kindness, for they kindled the fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, they came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Well, that's the serpent. That's the snake. That's a viper. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth him not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. So here we see Paul being bit by a viper, and it didn't harm him. Just, but now was Paul an apostle? Well, he was. So we see this is a, a sign that was given to an apostle. Now, in Mark 16, it says they shall take up serpents, okay? And I think what that's just saying is that, you know, serpents aren't going to have any effect on them. Not that they're going to put on a show. Okay, Paul here is not putting on a show. He didn't show, he isn't like, I'm going to show these barbarous people a thing or two and reach into a big sack of snakes. And was just, you know, but that's what we see today, isn't it? We see people doing that in churches. They're putting on a show by picking out snakes and handling them. You know, and there was that story that broke, uh, it was on Facebook or somewhere, I can't remember, not too long ago about a guy, one of these snake handlers that did it and nearly died twice. Doing, he'd gotten bitten, had to rush to the hospital, and, you know, and he said, oh, he's going to do it again, and then maybe he just lacked the faith. <laughs> Well, no, what the problem is is that you're not apostle, first of all, and your, right. your motives are completely wrong. Right. You know, God allowed that to happen in Paul's case so that these barbarous people would be, listen to what Paul had to say and, and get saved. So we see, first of all, that one of the signs that are given to the apostles here is that they will take up serpents. And we see in Scripture that the only person who have ever done that was actually an apostle. So I don't believe that this is something that applies to us today. Now, you can go ahead and argue with me with that, and you can go ahead and handle all the deadly snakes you want. But don't ever expect me to do it, okay? Now, the next thing, and this is, this is the next one. That, whenever you meet one of these snake handlers or people like that, I like to challenge them, you know, because maybe, because some people can handle snakes. I mean, you think about these guys, you know, in certain, uh, where they have the cobras and things like that. They can get down to the pit, and they can charm them and play with them. And even my own dad was in this tourist trap. He worked in this tourist trap in, uh, outside of the uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, called Reptile Gardens. And I've got pictures of my dad uh, milking baby rattlesnakes. Okay, now, of course, he didn't just walk up and grab them. He's being very careful about the, how they can do it. So a person could do this, right? They could say, hey, I'm a snake handler, I'm a charmer. But I would, I would say, okay, if you think that's, that's you, that you're on that level, well, why don't we step it up a notch? Why don't we drink in the deadly thing? You know, why don't we go out to my car and pull the battery out of it and dump all the acid into a glass, <laughs> and we'll watch you drink it. And we'll see if you really are, you know, an apostle or have these wonderful gifts that you're claiming. Now, I can't, I couldn't think of or find any that I know of. And maybe if you could think of one, you could remind me after the service of a scriptural example of this, of someone drinking some deadly thing. I just, I couldn't think of it off the top of my head. But I don't see any modern day snake handlers doing this. You know, I don't see them running into the, into the bathroom and grabbing a bucket of, a, a bottle of bleach and, and downing it in front of the congregation. You know, so... Again, if you're going to do one thing, well, why not the other? Yep. You know? So I don't believe that these signs are things that are uh, for us to do. And quite frankly, when a person is doing these type of things, when a person is handling these snakes, they're getting into what, the, what I believe is called tempting the Lord. They're beginning to tempt the Lord. The Bible says, you shall not tempt the Lord. I'm going to see if God you know, will protect me miraculously from this venomous snake. You know, I'm going to see if I have enough faith in God to handle this snake. You know, that's, that's a tempting of the Lord. That's yeah. this... This, I, this, uh, you know, this mentality of, you know, I'm going to push, I'm going to risk my life and limb, I'm going to go out and be a thrill seeker. You know, this whole mentality, I believe, is wrong. You know, there's, there's, that's why they call it being a daredevil, right? Being a daredevil. You know, you're somebody who's doing something you probably shouldn't do. You're, you're, you're risking life and limb. You're tempting God. You know, I'm going to go jump my motorbike across the Grand Canyon and see if, if, if God will get me across. You know, you're, you're tempting fate. You're tempting God. 
Now, the next sign, one of the other signs we see there, and if you would turn over to Acts chapter 5, is, you know, we first saw that they would take up serpents, that they would drink no deadly thing. And another one of the signs is that they would lay hands on the sick. He says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, there are a multitude of examples of this taking place, especially in the book of Acts. And, and, and we always see it's always one of the apostles, again, that are doing it. It says here, in the hands of the apostles, and, and by the hands of the apostles, verse 12, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all one accord in Solomon's porch, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them, and the believers were uh, the more added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. I mean, that was the ability and the power that the Lord had granted unto Peter. That people were saying, just let his shadow alone pass over us. Mm -hmm. You know, we think of, of the power that Jesus Christ had, the abilities that he had to heal the sick. He wouldn't even, the, the woman that reached out and, and just touched the hem of his garment and was healed immediately, you know, without Jesus having to even do anything. So we see that there are, there there are these special uh, miracles that are wrought, but they're wrought by the hands of the apostles. And again, there's a, there's a multitude of scriptures in Acts of the apostles carrying this out. It says there, uh, you know, in, in Acts 19.11, And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick uh, handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, the evil spirits went out from them. So he, people, you know, like, it'd be like if, if he was Paul, if Paul was preaching, tonight, and he had a runny nose like I do, they would say, let's borrow that hanky. Let's take that tissue and <laughs> take it to this person. And, you know, this apron, whatever, any garment that he touched, you know, take take, take uh, Paul's tie and take it to the sick person and let him be healed. I mean, that was the miracles that he had. So, I mean, if these apply to anybody, then why aren't we seeing everybody do this? You know, why aren't we seeing multitudes just being healed by these so-called faith healers and things like that? You see, these special miracles are, 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 are special in the fact that only Paul and a few of the other apostles were given the power to do them. And Paul even quoted here, I'll read it to you from 2 Corinthians verse 12, where it says, I am become a fool in glory, and he hath compelled me. For I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing I am behind the chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle will wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. He's saying, look, you've got to show me some respect, Paul is saying here. Because when I came to town, you saw the signs of an apostle wrought in me with all these uh, wonders and mighty deeds. <clears throat> so if all these things, if all these signs that we see that the apostles are doing, uh, that come, you know, that we see in Mark 16, apply to anybody, then, then what are the signs of an apostle? You know, if all these things can just apply to all believers, then what, what is the sign of an apostle then at that point? What are these signs and wonders? Mm -hmm. If it's healing the sick and anybody can do that, how is that a sign of an apostle? Well, yeah, of course Paul can do it. We all can. Yeah. Well, of course, of course he can shake off the beast. He can shake off the viper. We all can. Well, if they can all do it, then, then tell me, what is the sign of an apostle? If it's not these signs that he wrought. Yeah. Of course, one we see that was not exclusive to just the apostle is speaking in tongues. They did allow that. And you see that in Acts chapter 19. We won't... Uh, well, if you're, you're, you're close to there, I believe, if you're still in Acts, go over to Acts 19. I'll begin reading in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came into Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have you received, sent, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, We have not heard so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Why, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So there was this one gift. We're speaking with other tongues, and that's not a heavenly language. That's not babbling incoherently. That was actually being given the ability to speak in a foreign language so that others could hear and understand what it was you're saying. So we do see that that there were some signs that were given among them. But really, that's the only one. And we have to remember that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that if, there, that if there be tongues, they shall cease. So even that has passed away. 
You know, that's why we know, I know so many people in our church that study at work and work hard at learning a second language that they might preach the gospel to another nationality or another country or to another, somebody who does not speak English. People are learning Spanish, people are learning French, people are learning a whole multitude of different languages in order to give the gospel in that language. Well, what, why do they need to do that if tongues is still a thing? Why can't we just pray and ask God, hey, just open my mouth and help me to speak boldly as I ought to in another language? You know, because if there be tongues, they shall cease. These things have passed away. When that which is perfect is come, that which is uh, in part shall be done away. And I believe that's referring to the word of God. And of course, we know that the word of God was finished in, in Paul and John's day and Peter's day, the men that wrote it. We, they received that which was perfect. It came. The revelation was given, the Holy Ghost spake, and these things were recorded. And therefore, there was no need for these other signs to continue. Another sign, you see, if you're still in Acts 19, look over at verse 13. We're going to be in Acts 19 for just, uh, just another minute here. And one of the other signs that were mentioned there in Mark uh, chapter 16 is the fact that they could cast out devils. And this is the one that I think that makes people really wish this was true. Because they really want to have this ability to cast out devils. Because they, people just seem to get really caught up in this kind of a thing. They want to, you know, they want to look into things that they sh they should. They want to, you know, they want to uh, just caught up in this this uh, mystic kind of, you know, the spiritual realm. They want to, they desire to look into the, these things you know, about angels and demons and stuff like that. It's just a real cool thing that they want to get caught up in. So they think, well, you know, if we can get any of these signs of apostle, if we can get one, let's, let's have it be that cast out devils one, right? So that's when they, I think this is what they're really driving for. And I've heard, and I've heard, you know, uh, saved, born again believers and Baptist churches say, believe, say, yeah, you can do this. But I've never seen it done. I've never seen it happen. And I, but we do have an example here of people trying to do it. And that's here in Acts 19, verse 13, who were not apostles. It says, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took, them upon, took upon them to call over them which had uh, evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were, seven, uh, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, the chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, oh, they got the spirit's attention. You know, I mean, that, that's, what, that's the whole point of the exorcism, right? That's, you, we really want to get in contact with these, with these spiritual beings. And look what happens. He says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Mm -hmm. And the men in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known, uh, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks uh, also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So here we do see a group of people taking it upon themselves to try to uh, exercise a gift that is given unto the apostles, and they end up being very ashamed. They end up getting hurt physically, in fact, and then being ashamed publicly. So I believe that even this, this is exclusive to the apostles. Now, a lot of people object and say, yeah, that's because they were the vagabond Jews. You know, they weren't believers. They didn't have the spirit of Christ. So that's, why they, that's the reason why they couldn't do it. And, uh, you know, it's true that these were, uh, men weren't saved. That's not really a valid objection to say that it's, it's for that. Well, therefore, it's for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Benny Hinn isn't saved, okay? And neither is a Catholic priest, okay? But that doesn't stop Benny Hinn from taking his jacket off and slapping people with it and casting out devils. That doesn't stop the uh, Catholic priest from getting his holy water and going over and babbling his mumbo-jumbo over some demon-possessed person. Yeah. <clears throat> and they say, well, and then, and, you know, people have asked me, they say, well, how do you explain that? Because it, it looks like they have the power to do this. You know, and, I, and I've seen some of this stuff, and quite frankly, I don't like to look at it because it's, it's frightening. Yeah. But I have seen this stuff online. It's out there. Mm -hmm. And whether it's true or not, I mean, it's on YouTube. I mean, I've never seen this in my own, my own flesh. I've never seen this happen in, in, with my own eyes. It's always been something I've observed on a video or something. So you have to take it that it's, uh, it, it's the truth. Okay? Or you're, I've heard a lot of things secondhand. So-and-so cast out devils and things like this. So, well, okay, well, let's give them, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, we're not going to give Benny Hinn the benefit of the doubt, okay? That guy is just a fraud and a fake. And, and Okay, but what about the Catholic priests, right? Are they, is it possible they really are casting out devils? Well, I would say this. It, it's, it is possible, and here's why. Well, first of all, they're either lying, okay? We've kind of talked about that already. They're, they could just be lying. You have to consider the, possibi the possibility 
that it's just a big fraud, that they're lying. Yeah. But the other thing is to consider the fact that maybe the devil's working with them yeah. mm -hmm. in order to try and validate the Catholic Church. Yeah. Maybe he's saying, well, I know he doesn't really have the power to cast me out, but if I act like I got cast out, then people are going to believe the Catholic Church and go to hell uh -huh. because they're going to believe in a false, false gospel. That's right. So you have to kind of think things through a little bit, not just say, well, boy, it looks like the Catholic Church, these priests can cast out devils. Yeah, yeah but why is that? Is it because they're being empowered with the signs of an apostle? Definitely not. <laughs> so my, and you know, the, then there's my personal anecdotal experience, which is not valid. You know, this wouldn't hold up in a court of law. This isn't any kind of, you know, uh, validation of my point. It's just my, my personal opinion, what I observe, is that I have never seen it happen in almost 20 years of being Baptist churches around Christian people. I've never seen it happen. I've heard a lot of talk. I've heard a lot of people say it could be possible. Then why isn't it happening? Then why aren't we seeing it? Why are people getting cast out? You know, everything I've always heard has just been secondhand. You know, and it's important to kind of touch on this because people get carried away with this type of thing. You know, I've heard about people get going to, to Bible colleges and standing up and saying, oh, the mission field is on fire. People are raising the dead. They're even going somewhere and said that the dead are being raised out there in some foreign country. No, they're not. You know, and it's usually these Pentecostal types, it's these charismatics that only just make these wild claims about what's going on, and it's all a fraud. <clears throat> you see, I've heard people talk about this kind of, kind of thing, and they go so far as saying that people are even being raised from the dead. That's where this kind of stuff leads to. <clears throat> now, I want to just point out in this last verse, right, uh, before we move on to this last point, because after all, this is only verse 1 that we're doing when we're expounding so far, right? <laughs> but if, if you would, turn to Luke chapter 10, uh, Luke chapter 10, excuse me. Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, the Bible reads, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling, fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by, shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding. So he just says, yeah, that's great that you can do that. You know what? I saw even Satan being cast out from light. He said, yeah, I'm going to give you all these powers. But he goes on and says this, and he makes the point. He says, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you. He says, that's great. I'm glad you're excited about it. That's not something you rejoice over. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we should spend a lot of time trying to get excited about. And he goes on and says, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen. I mean, if we want to get excited about something in the spiritual life, how about the fact that we're going to heaven when we die? That's right. How about the fact that God knows who we are, that we're safe, and that we're going to see all these things? All the, I mean, you think... Seeing a devil cast out of somebody is something. I mean, imagine, you know, judging angels. Imagine seeing the devil cast into the lake of fire. That's right. I mean, we're going to see some great things just because of the fact that we're saved yeah. and our names are written in heaven. Yeah. You know, we should glory in what we know is ours to claim. What we know is ours to claim. We cannot claim the signs of an apostle, but what can we claim? Salvation in Christ, to be a citizen of heaven. So let's glory in that. Let's glory in these type of things. You know, and I want to remind us, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 11 as we, we'll make our way back there. I want to remind us one last time. I know I've mentioned this before in other sermons, but this is a point that needs, every time, I, I just want to stress this. Because this, I don't ever want us to lose sight of the importance of soul winning and what's really taking place when we're out soul winning. The greatest miracle you, anybody here in this room could ever do is going out and saving a soul. Amen. That's the greatest miracle. Amen. And that has more eternal, I mean, it, uh, impact on somebody than anything else in the world. And that changes the destiny of somebody's soul. Now, Jesus even kind of made the same point here in Matthew chapter 11. Look at verse 2. He says, Now when John had heard that it had, now when John had heard in the prison of in, in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. And he lists off all these wonderful miracles that Christ is doing. He says, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. I mean, these are wonderful things, miracles that only God could do. If any of, one of us did any of these things, we would think that's really something. But then he goes on and says this, the last thing. After this mighty list of miracles, what's the last thing he mentions? Mm -hmm. And the poor had the gospel preached unto them. Amen. He lists that right there with all these great miracles as, as receive, you know, giving the sight back to the blind, causing the lame walk again. And causing the deaf to hear and raising up the dead. And he says the last thing is to having the gospel. So that 
Really, it's the greatest miracle that any of us could ever, uh, ever do. Now let's go ahead and go back to Matthew chapter 10, and let's get out of verse 1. So we're, we're four, into the fourth page of notes, and we've only got one verse down. But I think we have time, if that clock would work with me a little bit. So we're going to get into verse 2 where it says, Now the names of the twelve apostles were these, the first Simon, who's called Peter and Andrew, and bro his brother James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and uh, Levius, whose name was whose surname was Thaddeus, and, uh, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve uh, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city of the Samaritans, entering ye not, but go rather to the lost house of the sheep of Israel. Now some people will turn to this and say, Aha! See, Jesus had preferential treatment of the Jews. He's saying the Jews are God's chosen people. That's why he sent them there first. But this isn't preferential treatment. What I believe this is, is a, a last-ditch effort on Jesus', on Jesus part to try and wake the Jews up to what's taking place, that their Messiah is here, that the Christ has come, and that they need to believe, believe on him. It reminds me of the, the parable of Luke 13. We both turn there where it says, uh, you know, a certain man had planted a fig tree, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and he found none. It's kind of like God coming to the nation of Israel and not finding the fruit, not finding the believers that he should have been able to find. And he said unto the vine dresser, Behold, these three years I come. Now, how long was Jesus on the earth? Three years, right? So he's there three years. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down while I come to the gown. Yep. Saying, get rid of it. It's good for nothing. And, and, and he answering said unto the Lord, let alone this year also, till I dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after thou, thou shalt cut it down. So the Bible's real clear, you know, that God, uh, you know, did away with the nation of Israel. That he scattered them into all nations. And that he judged them because they rejected him. He also rejected them. And I don't want to spend a, a, a lot of time on that. So let's just move uh, right on into verse uh, 7 where it says, And as ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely, uh, freely give. Provide, uh, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And again, this is just a great place to kind of just, you know, there's going to be a lot of little things that we just touch on as we go. We'll make, develop some other points later in the sermon. But we want to pass by this. We don't want to uh, forget to mention that full-time workers are being supported by other, being, being su supported by others is biblical. Right? It's biblical to be paid to work for Christ. Mm -hmm. okay, and, we, and this is important because a lot of people today, they take issue with this. And, and if you can take the, if you make this a point of contention, well, you can excuse yourself from going to any church, because most any church has somebody on staff. Any, and well, was the pastor being paid by the church? I'm out of here. Is there paid staff here? Well, you know that's unbiblical. I'm gone, and now I'm just going to be me and my my few my few friends in my living room, just me and my family hanging out, having church. That's not church. Yeah. Church is the assembly of the believers together. And whether you agree with that or not, you know, that, that whether or not they should be, people should be paid, you still need to be in the house of God. You know, but we, want, we don't want to kind of, uh, we want to take that, that rug out from under him. You know, so we see right here, Jesus says, you know, don't take anything with you guys when you go. You know, let, every, let's, let the people that you're preaching to take care of you and provide for your needs. I'm not saying let them make you rich. That's not what he said. You know, don't, don't, don't expect a horse and buggy to get around in that they should buy you. But they're going to take care of your daily needs. And uh, so we see here, you know, like it says, the workman is worthy of his meat, that full-time workers being supported by others is biblical. Mm -hmm. And there's other passages we could go to. 1 Corinthians 9 says, Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the holy things of the temple? Referring back to Levitical priesthood, saying, you know, the priests who were ministering to the things of God for the people yeah. on their behalf, they were also taking care of, of the things of the temple. Right. The sacrifices and offerings that came into the temple, that's what sustained them. That was the example that Paul is referring back to in 1 Corinthians 9. And he says that they that which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. He says, even so, in the same manner, likewise, just as it was then, even now, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a paid staff, a pastor being paid is a biblical concept. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. So we're going to move on to verse 11 where it says, And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, Inquire uh, who in it is is worthy, and there abide until you go thence. And when you come to that and to an house, salute it. 
And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. And if it be not worthy, let your peace return unto you. And I love that he keeps saying this, like some are worthy and some aren't worthy. You know, they're, 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 you know, some people aren't worthy of our time. Some people aren't worthy of uh, a man of God coming to them and preaching uh, God, the gospel to them. Someone bringing the gospel. If they're, if they're, they deem themselves unworthy. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. He said, don't waste your time preaching to those who will not hear. They deem themselves unworthy. You know, it's not that they go in there and they give them some kind of an aptitude test to see whether or not they're worthy to receive the gospel. They go in there and they, they, they know whether they're worthy or unworthy by how they respond to the preaching of the word of God. You know, when we go and knock on a door and someone's a rude jerk at the door and doesn't want to give us the time of day, well, they deem themselves unworthy. Yeah. We're not going to stand there and say, sir, 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 and try to get them back to the door after they just slammed it in our face and say, you know, you got to hear this. It's really important. No, we just move on to the next person. We go find somebody who is worthy and preach to them. Amen. You know, and this kid, I love this because it says there, uh, when you depart out of that house or that city. So this could apply, apply to a single house outdoor door knocking. This could apply to an entire city. You know, a church is established somewhere in some town. The pastor is zealous. He's on fire for God. He wants to do a great work. He's out there knocking the doors in his community. You know, he's not, you know, every single door in his community. And we know pastors like that who have gone to small towns, even here in Arizona, and have literally knocked every single door in that community through his church. And that nobody comes. Nobody wants to hear the preaching of the word of God. They're all too busy with their own lives. That city has deemed themselves unworthy. And when that man of God pulls up stakes and goes to another city and starts to great work, that is biblical. That is correct. That is the right thing to do. We shouldn't waste time with people or even entire cities that want nothing to do with the gospel. That don't want anything to do with the preaching of God. We could use those talents elsewhere and we could and see greater works done. We'll move on here where it says uh, in verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. As doves. Now, verse 16 is a great principle, again, for soul winning. It's a very important principle. First, we have to understand, he says there, that he sends us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Okay, so there are wolves, right? There are people out there who want to attack they want to inflict harm. They want to do uh, harm to the body of Christ. They want to harm. They want to hinder the gospel being spread. There are people out there who exist to uh, withstand the works of God. You've seen that. So there are wolves. They do attack. Now I want to say this. Not every unsaved jerk is a wolf. Yep. Not every guy who's too busy shining his golf club in his garage you know, is a, is a wolf. He's just a jerk. Okay, There's a difference. Maybe another day he won't be a jerk. Maybe another day... He will listen. Maybe he won't be so worried about, you know, how his score is in the back nine and take the time to listen to what you have to say. But on that particular day, he's been, that doesn't not automatically make him a wolf. Now, there are wolves out there. When they hear somebody come and bring the gospel, they attack. You know, there's several guys in here that could attest to this even recently, having some psycho hound them through an apartment complex, you know, and getting the cops on the phone and, and yada, yada, yada. So there are people out there, but not every single person just gives you an attitude who is just a little rude to you, or very dismissive, or condescending, or doesn't, doesn't want to give you the time of day, that doesn't automatically make them a wolf. That doesn't automatically make them a reprobate. It just means that today's not a good day for them, and that today's just not their day. And hopefully they have another opportunity. You know, unfortunately, that, you know, they're, they're too caught up in, in something else. Now, it goes on and says here that we are uh, to be wise as serpents. Now, wise as serpents. That's a really interesting thing to liken us unto, especially as when we think about it in the terms of being a soul winner. You know, a serpent isn't, some, isn't something that strikes unprovoked. You know, a wolf is somebody who goes out hunting for prey, looking who he can get. You know, and, but a serpent isn't, isn't necessarily that way. He's not, you know, looking just to go out and get whoever he can. A lot of times they're, they're very calm and still, and they wait for something to pass by, and then they strike. Um, so they're not, they're not necessarily... You know, hunting in packs. They're not going out and pursuing prey. They're very patient. They know when to strike, when not to strike. So it's really interesting that, you know, he like, likens us onto serpents. You know, and I don't think, uh, you know, if we think in, in terms of just an animal defending itself, like a serpent, uh, you know, it doesn't strike unprovoked. 
you know, if, if someone ends up getting bit by a snake, you know, they probably didn't listen to the first half of the sermon, first of all. Or, you know, and they're out there just trying to, like, provoke a snake or, or something like that, or they, they stumble upon it, they, they come across it, they go to step on it, maybe. You know, I, I think of a story when I was young, my cousins and I were running through the woods, and uh, one of, he was running ahead of me, he, he, he jumped, he, like, ran and jumped off of a log, and it rolled over, and there was just a whole den of, of rattlesnakes, like baby rattlesnakes. And, of course, him being the bright 12-year-old that he was, thought, well, these are cool, and wanted to grab one, and it tried to bite him, and then he proceeded to actually get one and cut its head off the rock. Now, I don't recommend anyone doing that, <laughs> but, you know, what if he'd gotten bit? Well, that would have been on him. You know, he's the one who's provoking these things. What I'm saying is, you know, we don't, we don't want to just strike unprovoked. You know, we meet somebody at the door, they're rude. You know, let's not just sink our fangs into them. You know, we come across some heretic who's got something wrong. Let's not just take the time to, like, just devour them whole and swallow them and spit out the bones. You know, we need to know when to strike and, and sometimes when to just kind of, you know, rattle the tail a little bit. Just let them know, hey, you're wrong here. You know, an example is this. I ran into a guy here in Tucson that was saying that Jesus was, uh, that Jesus either was the brother, there was like Mormon something or other. He's kind of a crazy dude saying that Jesus was the devil. They're the same person. You know, and I thought, but I could tell the guy wasn't just trying to be, dumb about it or he wasn't just trying to like provoke me so you know I didn't feel like I had to like tear him apart but I did very strongly re rebuke him and say you know what you're wrong about that the Bible's very clear and you need to get that right to have a good day so I did you know I didn't really take the time to try and kill the guy but I did warn him right and that's what a serpent does he kind of shakes the tail and says hey I'm over here you know you're getting a little too close you're wrong to be here this is about the area you need to be in and a really good proverb that kind of drives this point home is it says in Proverbs 26, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. So I said, don't, don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. You know, we don't always want to answer a fool in the same manner that he is with us. We don't want to respond in kind to him. And the next verse does say, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So we have to understand and use discernment what it is we're going to answer a fool and when we're not. You know, what is the motive? What's the point? You know, what are we really, are, what are we trying to accomplish in answering a fool? Are we trying to, you know, just, you know, uh, try to one-up him, you know, or just kind of answer and be like him, you know, just get in an argument and say something back to, back to him? Or is it because we're trying to not let him think that he's outsmarted us, being wise in his own conceit? So <laughs> that's kind of a inter couple of interesting verses. It's something to meditate and think about. You know, are these people just provoking you? Are they just speaking nonsense? You know, don't answer in the same manner. Well, I'm going to provoke you back. I'm going to speak some nonsense back. Let's, let's talk some trash. Or maybe, you know, they're a fool, but they're sincere people that are just genuinely deceived. They're caught up in some foolish, dumb doctrine. But they're genuine. You know, they're just simple. You know, we should test the waters, you know, and see if they're open to being corrected. Uh, you know, we are to be as doves. He says we're to be as servants. We are to be as doves. You know, a dove is interesting in the fact that, you know, it, it takes flight. You know, if something comes and threatens it, it doesn't hang around. It just gets out of reach. It leaves. You know, that's a good principle in soul winning. When we're getting into it with somebody, sometimes the best thing to do is to say, have a good day and walk away and just not get into it with someone. You know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not interested. Okay, well, you have a nice day. You know, then, then they proceed to tell you, because when I was in church, you know, they start trying to give you why they're not interested. You know, well, the dove, that, I'm just going to make myself like a dove and spread my wings and fly away, you know, and, and just say, have a nice day. And, uh, and that's, that's the attitude we should have. You know, we shouldn't make ourselves easy targets for these people. We should be like doves. Let's go ahead and move on to verse 17 where it says, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony unto them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought or uh, how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father shall put the child... And the father, the child, and the child shall rise up against the parents and cause them to be put to death. And they shall be hated, and ye shall be hated of all men for my sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, of course, this, this idea of enduring to the end and being saved, this is something that often gets twisted by those that would preach a works-based salvation, of saying that you have to attain some 
level of sinless perfection, and then you have to maintain that, le that level of sinless perfection all the way until your dying day, if you want to endure to the end, you know, and, and be saved. That somehow you, you, you resisting the devil, you resisting sin in your life, you living a godly Christian life is what's going to take you to heaven. Now, first of all, you know, just right out of the gate, we know that's false because, again, that creates glaring contradictions in Scripture. Amen. We know that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, that it is the gift of God, that it's not of works, as they mentioned both. Right. So we know that's not what this is referring to. What it's referring to is that uh, it is a physical salvation it's referring to here. It's not referring to a spiritual salvation. I mean, consider the context. He's talking about you being delivered up into the synagogues, you being delivered up under the councils, you know, the children uh, 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 giving up, the, you know, the parents giving up the children, the children giving up the parents to be scourged and all these things that take place. And uh, being hated of all men. You know, it's talking about a physical persecution here. That's what we're supposed to endure. You know, see that phrase there where it says hated of all men is a phrase used to describe the tribulation prior to Christ's second coming. You find that over in... Uh, Go ahead and turn to Mark, or Matthew chapter 24. You'll see that that phrase, uh, hated of all men, is used in Mark 13 and Luke 21, which are parallel passages to Matthew 24, where we're going, which uses a, a similar phrase. It doesn't say hated of all men. It says hated of all nations. Well, what of nations? They they're, consist of men. They consist of human beings. It says there in Matthew 24, Verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of all his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us what, uh, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and the end of the world? That Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall have rumor, uh, hear of wars and rumors of wars, see they be not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my sake. So it's a physical persecution that's coming in God's people. And then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, right? Like we saw back in Matthew 10, where the family is delivering up the family, the parents, the children, the children, the parents. And shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, is Jesus saying you have to go through all this in order to go to heaven? No. No, what he's saying is that if you endure all of this, you know, if, you're, if you end up not being afflicted, then you're going to be saved. In what sense? And that the, for the very elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's right. That Jesus will come and that those, that persecution will cease. You see, the physical endurance is what results in a physical salvation when Jesus Christ comes to puts an end to the persecution. Let's see what we're doing on time. Let's just go ahead and move on here. Um, I think we all understand that. I don't think anybody in this room is struggling with that, you know, tonight thinking that they have to, uh, you know, do some kind of mighty work like a dory persecution or go to heaven. So we'll move along here. Uh, it says here in verse, uh, verse 23, Make sure I'm on the right verse here. Yeah. yeah, verse 23. But when they shall persecute in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, shall not come over the city of Israel till you the Son of Man become. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of, him, uh, of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that ye preach, preach ye in the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows uh, sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very heads of your hair, very hairs of your head, excuse me, are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before him for men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. 
So he's telling them here, you know, that they should not be afraid, that they should preach those things which they have heard in darkness and light, that they should preach these things upon the housetop and not be afraid of them which kill the body, and that if they are, that they will be, that if they deny Christ before men, that he will deny them before the Father. Again, I don't believe he's talking about salvation there. Uh, you know, if you're given an opportunity to, to, to do something, a very bold work before men for God, you know, I believe that there will be commended for that in heaven, that those that would uh, endure uh, affliction or persecution because of the word of God are going to be rewarded in heaven. But if they refuse to do that when the opportunity comes, then he's going to deny you that from the Father. He's not saying, you know, depart from me, I, I, I never knew you. That's not what he's talking about when he's saying that he would deny you from the Father. He's just saying, I'm going to deny you the rewards you otherwise would have earned for having endured that, uh, that reproach. Amen. But we can learn from this is that we should never be ashamed of the word of God or hold back any part of it. You know, we should always be willing to preach the whole word of God. You know, if somebody asks us, do you believe this because of the Bible? We should always answer emphatically, yes. Amen. We should be never say, well, if someone wants to you know, criticize what we believe, we'll say, well, that's what the Bible says. Amen. And not be ashamed of the word of God. This is especially applicable to those who would uh, preach the word of God. You know, not just out soul, but maybe in a, behind a pulpit. Or, you know, you take a, you can even think about just taking a stance in your life or having some kind of a standard in your life that's based upon the word of God. You know, that sense that's kind of you, your life is preaching to those around you. Or even in the, you know, in the most literal sense, preaching behind a pulpit or preaching to a, a group of people. You know, we should never back off on the word of God. And that's a real problem that we have today, especially in pulpits, yes. is that people are, are refusing to pre preach, uh, preach uh, entire sections of the Bible or great or truths that are very contrary to the culture that we live in. Right. You know, we think about, you know, the, 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 uh, the homosexual agenda, you know, the homos, the queers that are trying to just, you know, run everybody down with their, with their uh, agenda of just accepting their sin and their filth. And, and, and a lot of preachers have just backed off. Yep. You know, they're not going to turn over to Leviticus 20, 13. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got an original out of an old Bible right there. That's yeah. Leviticus 20 right there. And yes, verse 13 is there. <laughs> so, you know, we love that verse. We yep. embrace it because we're not afraid of any part of the Word of God. Amen. You know, there's nothing in the Word of God that any of us should ever be ashamed of. You know, it's, and none of the, there's nothing in the Word of God that anyone who would stand up and preach should ever be ashamed to preach or refuse to preach because of the backlash. You know, and there's nothing, there should be nothing that you should hear preached out of the Word of God that causes you to, you know, to, to, to squirm or to, or to buck or, 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 you know, ruffles your feathers. You should embrace all of it. We should love all of the Word of God, every bit of it. And, you know, the Bible does talk about not being afraid. You know, it's, it's, it, it's easy to just get up and say that. You know, but God had to remind Jeremiah, he said, uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, he said, whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. You know, Jeremiah had to bring some hard messages to the nation of Israel. I mean, it was doom, gloom, judgment, you know, and quite frankly, that's kind of the message that needs to be preached to America today. Is that they're, they, they've, uh, you know, they've shed a lot of innocent blood. And that, that, that they are pushing a wicked homo, uh, homosexual agenda in, yep. uh, in the world, that they that they're they're a bunch of uh, you know drunkards and fornicators and adulterers, and that this country is a wicked country, yeah. and it's it's right. easy to just get up and say you know America rah 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 we love God bless America that's an easy message to preach, mm -hmm. and that's what most pastors and preachers want to preach today, It's just that you know it's the love of God it's the grace of God God's not mad at you, but there is a very hard message that needs to be preached. And we as preachers should be uh, willing to preach that and not be afraid of their faces. You know, and, 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 and people who are hearing the, the preaching, they shouldn't be making faces. Right. Quite frankly, there shouldn't be a reason to be afraid of their faces. They should be embracing what they're hearing if it's from the Bible. Again, not what some man is saying, but what God has spoken. So, you know, as long as we speak these words, the words of Christ, the Bible, you know, we can have a confidence in that regardless of how it's received. Whether they like it or whether they lump it, you know, it's the word of God. Let's go ahead and verse 34, we'll, we'll wrap it up where it says, Think not I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword, for I am come to set a man at variance, variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now that's a hard message. Do you think Jesus was uh, afraid to preach that? And, you know, was he hasn't, was he... Expecting a warm, oh, great, a nice pat on the back. That was a very encouraging sermon today. Uh, Jesus, we, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Right? Thank you for telling me that my own, the foes are going to be those of my own house. 
And, you know, he, he goes on and says, it gets a little harder. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's right. He goes on and says, he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh on his cross and following me, followeth me is not worthy of me. So we can deem ourselves unworthy, you know, by violating one of these things, by being found guilty of this. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life shall find it. You see, an authentic Christian life, one that's real, a genuine Christian life, is one that exalts and abides uh, the word of God above all things. You know, one that's going to say, I'm going to live this book, I'm going to exalt this book, no matter what it costs me, above all things. You know, even in the, in the fact that it might even cost you everything. You know, that's what a genuine faith does. That's what a genuine love of the Word of God will do in a person. To the point where they're even going to say, son or daughter does not compare to, to Jesus. That he, they would have preference for him and the things of right. God. Amen. Now, of course, we know that Jesus isn't saying here, you know, that we should hate all these people in our life and treat them poorly. Right? That's not what he's saying. He's just saying, if you would do so well unto them, you know, you should do even better unto me. Mm -hmm. And that if it did cost us, cost us everything, we should be willing to give that, pay that, that, that price. And in many cases, you know, in a lot of people's lives, to some degree, you know, I've heard multiple testimonies, and I know my own life as well, that it, it does cost us our earthly relations. If not, you know, completely, to some degree, you know, people uh, start to treat you differently. Uh, you might have to limit the time you spend with certain individuals. There might even be individuals that have to cut completely out of your life uh, because of the word of God. But, and a lot of people really, they don't like that. But here's the thing, what they forget is that does not mean, if you have to do that, if you have to take such a strong stance in your life, where you're just saying, I'm not even going to speak with so-and-so anymore. Now, you know, I'm not saying, you know, every time they get together at Thanksgiving and they, and they, have, they have a few beers, you know, you're, you're, you're anathema to me, you know, you're dead to me. You know, we're not gonna shun that individual. But if they're a reprobate, I mean, if they're, if they're you know, That's right. if, if they're queers, they're fags, they're raised a fag, I don't want anything to do with them. Yeah. You know, and quite frankly, I, I, I have a very close relationship who's cut me out of their life. I didn't even have to do the dirty work. They did it for me. And I'm fine with that. Because I don't want anything to do with that filth. I don't want anything to do with that with, with something that with people that hate God. Mm -hmm. They hate God so much that it, it, that attack the word of God. I, I don't want anything to do with them. Yeah. So that was that that didn't really cost me anything. You know, it cost me a relationship, but it cost me a relationship with somebody that I really didn't want anything to do with anyway. So, but sometimes, you know, we do have to make hard decisions and, and, and limit people in our life who we're going to spend our time with, what, what kind of people we're going to surround ourselves with. And, and a lot of people kind of can't take that, but they forget that that's not going to, this doesn't mean you're going to be left destitute with no companions in life. It's not like you're just going to, you know, cut part ways with old friends or family, and now you're just going to be, you know, this loner in life. Because uh, of the fact that, you know, we receive much more in Christ. If you would turn over to Mark chapter 10. We'll pull this here in Mark chapter 10. <laughs> Mark chapter 10. You know, if, if living for Christ costs us some earthly relations, you know, that's not the end of it. It's not just like, you know, so-and-so is no longer a part of our life, and now there's nothing to replace this. You know, there, the Bible teaches the opposite. Here in Mark chapter 10, look at verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man, not just you, Peter, but there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels. And he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Now, anyone who's done this can attest to the fact that this is true. You know, we, we, we left, you know, uh, we left uh, Michigan, we left all of our family behind, you know, we had a nice big green yard, biggest yard in the block, you know, it was nice. Oh, we've forsaken so much for Christ, you know. I had to sell a computer, oh. <laughs> I cut off an arm. I gave a kidney. You no, know, it, it, you know, it was nothing. I mean, in the light of what others have paid for, for, for following Christ. That's right. But, you know, that's not to make light of the fact that sometimes we make moves. We leave people behind. We leave uh, homes that we're comfortable in behind. And, uh, but the Bible's saying here when we do that, that we gain more. 
That's right. And he's saying 104 more. You know, I think about the fact, how many people do we know now that were part of a great church that would not open their homes to us if we were in need? You know, if, if we were down and out, if something terrible had happened, we were destitute, I mean, there's just dozens of people that I could probably go to and say, hey, we're having a really hard time. Can you help us out? And they would open their homes. You know, so that's that's the hundredfold homes. Yep. Don't get this idea that if you for, for say it's in the prosperity message, give one home to Jesus, he gives you a hundred. You know, it's not, that's not how it works. This isn't a real estate deal. He's trying to make the point that you know you're gaining spiritual brethren, you're gaining spiritual uh, you know companionship in in those that are in, in Christ. You see, we can develop relationships with others in the church, with other believers, with other saved individuals that are every bit as close as those that we were raised with. Or, or, or raised us, you know, our, our familiar relations can be just as, we can have relationships that are just as close, or even closer in a lot of ways, because we have more common ground yeah. with those that are spiritual brethren, rather than just our blood relations. I'll close with this, it says here in Proverbs, it says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So that is the caveat, right? You know, it's not just like, de facto, I'm part of a church, I moved here, you know, now everyone's going to be my best friend. You, know, you still have to you still have to put forth the effort to, to be a friendly person, right? And, uh, and and that's that's the caveat. But it does say here at the end, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You know the the friend the people that we uh, serve with along in, in Christ and that we uh, go through life with, serving the Lord and and raising our children together and growing up in Christ, meeting together in the house of God praying together, doing great works for God together, those can bring people very close together. And we develop those relationships to the point that, you know, just as you would a brother or sister that maybe you were raised with in, in, a, in a family or something like that. You know, and I could attest to this. This is very true in my life. In fact, there have even been people in Faithful Word that remind me of, of, of a sister, you know, just physically, like the way they look even. And I'm like, man, she looks like my sister. You know, I've had that happen a couple times where it felt like, and then not only that, they were like a spiritual sister. Or, you know, and I, I've had people in the church that, my brothers, I thought, there's been individuals I said, if I ever had a big brother, it would be this guy because of the way he treats me. So anyway, <laughs> my point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, with the, with the right motive, you know, if we do these things for the gospel's sake, if we're willing to give up these things, you know, God promises us that we're going to receive, the, you know, even greater spiritual blessings. You know, we're going to receive the spiritual brethren and sisters. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.